Wow, what a, what a wonderful presence of the Lord in here today. Just his love is good to have Mark and Alma back. They've been ministering down in Peru for like a month. So good to have you guys back. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I'll jump into this series I've been doing, God's Faithfulness, uh, here in just a minute. But I got back from, I was at a four-day church conference this week in Lancaster, PA. Our network that we're a part of, Global Awakening, had their annual, uh, they call it Voice of the Apostles Conference. And it was really good this year. And uh, just, you know, what I really, you know, because a couple of folks have asked me, you know, what, what were the highlights? And, and, you know, one of the, I think the things that was most refreshing for me, other than a couple moments with the Lord where I just felt that, you know, him encourage me and speak some things to me um, and, and catching up with some old friends, some that I've known for 25 years and things. Uh, all of the speakers, and many of them have international ministries and things, all of them emphasized Jesus. It was all about Jesus. Everybody say, it's all about Jesus. And it was so encouraging. You know, that theme was just there throughout about the, 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 the glory of Christ, the, the majesty of Christ, and that, and that our, our role really as believers, uh, you know, you're I'll start meddling right off the bat and I haven't got to my message yet. You know, your role isn't just to get somebody to say the sinner's prayer. What your job is, is to be so close to Jesus that you exude his very love and presence in a world that's desperately looking for peace and hope in this, in this time. Does that make sense? And if you really look at the early church, what the early church did, they didn't really go out and, you know, they didn't have Romans Road, you know, <laughs> you go, go through all the different little points on how to lead someone to Christ. Again, those things can be helpful at times, but really it's people watch us. They see us. So it's where you are and where you work, your neighbors, uh, you interact with people all the time. People, people it's, it, they want to see Jesus in us and that his peace, his love, his joy, that's what's attractional. That's really how the early church began to grow. Sure, there was, you know, amazing supernatural things that happened, and we all, we all believe in that, and God still moves today. But they need to see the love and care that we have for uh, folks. You know, arguments aren't going to win the day anymore. You realize that. But, I mean, we just see what's going on in all kinds of realms, and everybody can have a YouTube channel. Everybody's got something on social media to say. People hear a lot of talk, but what they want is to experience the love and the presence of Christ through a real body of believers or through the body of Christ globally, and that's what's going to begin. Because people are hungry, and newsflash, the shaking's only going to continue, okay? And so the more anchored we are in him, the more it's attractional uh, to a world that's, that's really looking for him. All right, so again, this series, God's Faithfulness, I've been talking about Abraham's faith and obedience the last couple of weeks. I'm going to jump over to Hebrews 11 here in just a second. And one of the things that I've really tried to emphasize as I've been going through this series is just how good God is, how much he loves us, how much he cares for us. He knows the day's fashion for us when there was yet none of them. He knows our sitting down or rising up. He's so uh, sovereign that he gives us free will. He lets us choose to love him. He lets us choose to walk with him. He doesn't make us walk with him, right? And he invites us in this journey with him. And Jesus says, you know, come, come follow me, right? And so we get to do that, and Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. So everything that you want to know about the Father, read through the Gospels, and you see in Jesus, right? He was complete love. He was complete acceptance. This doesn't mean that there's not parameters and things that God puts in his words for us to live by. But what I mean by that is that he didn't judge, he rather accepted. He ate with the sinners and the tax collectors, those in society that folks wouldn't, the religious crowd didn't want anything to do with. And what did he do? He loved on them. He showed them how much he loved them, how much he cared for them. He died for every one of them, past, present, and future. He died for you and I. And but, oh, by the way, uh, the last I checked in Scripture, we're not much better than a tax collector or a sinner. <laughs> Aren't you glad the love of the Father exhibited through Jesus? You know, there's an old saying, we all put our pants on the same way. <laughs> Ladies' dresses, whatever, okay? 
And uh, we're all, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't matter how successful we are in life, how much money we earn, what kind of education we get, what kind of maybe even great things we do for the Lord. When it comes right down to it, it's all about our walk with him and, and first and foremost being a disciple of Christ, loving him and then letting that love transform through us, right? All right, let's jump over to Hebrews 11. I'll give you some more official teaching here. Okay. All right. And so, again, we've been looking at this journey. Again, if you're newer here today and you haven't, I think this is my, might be week five um, or maybe even week six that I started this series. I started back in Genesis with Abraham and Sarah looking at their life. And so now the last couple of weeks I've been in Hebrews 11 where there's a little more of a narrative um, about them. And so picking up in verse faith, it says, uh, verse eight of Hebrews 11, it says, by faith... Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. He obeyed. Last week I talked about how Abraham believed. Abraham and Sarah believed. You have to believe, you have to obey, and you need to have an eternal perspective. And so I want to really look at this thing of obedience today. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for he waited for this city, this is this eternal perspective, which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Considering the outcome, oh, I'm sorry, missed, grabbed too many pages. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky, multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. I'll just stay there for a second. And so, by faith, Abraham obeyed. He, there he is, there in the, uh, the you know, Haran. Uh, there, he sort of actually was Abraham's father. If you remember back, I talked about this in. Genesis 11, they're on this trek from this part of Mesopotamia, and they get into this air, uh, area, area called the Air of Chaldees, and, and this particular this town of Haran. And he actually spends 30 years there in Haran. His father dies there, the family, all of this kind of things. And so he gets a little settled. Now imagine, some of you have lived in your houses a long time or lived in the city a while. Imagine being in one place for 30 years. Family, roots, home, well, tents maybe in their case, okay, but there's a sense of security, the familiarity, and all of a sudden, the Lord speaks to Abram. He says, get up and get out, Genesis 12. Get up and get out to a land I'm going to tell you. And all of a sudden, this is a major change. It is daunting enough that it's you know, 1,200 some miles across the desert to a place he's not been to and he's got to take everybody. But he's leaving the known and the secure. That's an important theme that I want to touch on a little bit today. And, and this thing of being willing to go, and it says he obeys, Hebrews 11.8, by faith Abraham obeys when he's called to go out. To this place he would receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. Now I touched on some of this last week and uh, he gets this land, but he never really possesses the promised land. He gets a cave in Hebron where Sarah would eventually be buried and he would be buried. So the fullness of the promise, he doesn't even see. And yet he obeys because God tells him to go out. I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of the sky, but yet his wife is barren, no children. And God gives this amazing promise. And so there he is. He leaves this known and secure. And I just wonder for a moment, has God ever asked you something that would cost you to leave the known and secure? Maybe he's asked you to leave a job because he wants you to risk taking some other position. Or maybe he's asked you to leave a job because there's an area of ministry that he wants you to get involved with. Maybe he's even put on your heart 
to do something for the Lord. Maybe it's serve in the local church. Maybe it's do more outreach, whatever. Maybe he's asking you to go across the street and talk to a neighbor. And he's putting on your heart, and your heart's pounding. Go over there and talk to them. Take them a loaf of bread. Make a, I don't know. I'm just make, make a loaf of bread. Take it to and go pray for them. They need your prayers. And so sometimes he has us leave the known and secure, and that's what the Christian walk is all about, right? Jesus didn't say, come follow me, and everything is going to be laid out before you. He said, follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to make you ones that would be attractional to a world that really isn't attracted to me. And then he would tell them, listen, don't be surprised when, when folks would persecute you because they'll do that to the Son of Man also. The Lord has a strange way of really creating a family, doesn't he? <laughs> Come join this army. Come be part of this family. And oh, by the way, you might get some stones thrown at you along the way. And yet somehow throughout over 2,000 years, the Spirit of God has moved on the heart of humanity. And folks just like us throughout every age all of a sudden had that heartbeat inside of us. And it's like, I don't know what it is about Jesus. But I'm willing to leave all to go follow him. Sometimes it might be risking leaving what maybe your family is comfortable with. Maybe you were raised in a family that was agnostic or maybe atheist, and all of a sudden you decide to start attending church or Bible study, and they're not comfortable with that. Maybe you were raised in another denomination, and all of a sudden there's a stirring in your heart that there's maybe something more that I'm not getting here, and all of a sudden the Lord begins to lead you in a way, and your family's not in agreement with it. I have a great love for the Catholic Church now, but when I first gave my life to Christ, I was like, ooh. I remember sharing with my grandfather, my maternal grandfather that I just adored. I remember one of the last times him and I were alone, my grandmother had passed on. I was in my, in my 30s. I was actually finishing my master's in theology, and I made a trip, I'm from Iowa, I made a trip back to Iowa, and it was in the early October, the weather was just starting to change there. And my grandfather, we did, as a kid, I did a lot of fishing with him and hunting and things like that, spent a lot of time with him. And I remember him and I, we'd gone squirrel hunting, and uh, he wanted to fry that squirrel that night, he, killed, he ruined that squirrel. <laughs> but we're sitting there and we're talking, we're eating, and he looks at me at one point, and I was, he was asking me about things I was doing and everything. And, and by this time, we'd, you know, been all over the world ministering and different things like that. And, and he looks at me at one point, and he goes, I'll never forgive you for leaving the Catholic Church. And he just kept, kept eating. He was a devout man. Never saw him drink, never saw him swear hardly. I mean, a couple times he hit a cow, and he had a word or two. <laughs> But uh, he was a good man. But he couldn't. Are, are you with me? Yeah. This thing of following Jesus, it, it might cost something. And I think one of the things that the Lord, even in this hour, is, is putting before us, he never compels us. Remember I shared this last week. His invitation is always through love. He's not a demanding, austere father. He's not harsh. And if you grew up in anything like that or been in a religious culture that was harsh and judgmental or legalistic, that's not the Father. Sure, there are all of these different things in the Bible that we see. The Jews, uh, the, you know, the Old Testament, 613 laws and 10 commandments. And the purpose of the law was, what did Paul say? It was our tutor, it was our schoolmaster to bring us into grace. The purpose of the law wasn't to show us how wicked we were. It's just how much we needed a Savior, grace, because we're never going to do it right or get it all right. And yet he bids us to walk with him. And so like Abraham, we're walking this faith walk of obedience even when we don't understand. God may ask you to do things sometimes that are not in a financial course that maybe you take at a church or something. He may actually ask you to radically give in some way. 
He may ask you to be willing to risk because he's got something, an inheritance for you. You can't see it yet. It's scary trying to walk on the water with Jesus. But it's always worth it. I was having dinner with a couple of friends while I was there in PA this week. And they were asking me some different questions about things and how we you know, ran things in the church and different things and church budgets and stuff like that, and different things. And, and at one point I smiled and I said, you know, because both of the men that were there and one of them had his wife there and had been with, with me on a trip down to Brazil in 2006. We saw powerful things. We were near the Amazon uh, River Basin area, this area called Santa Rim, Brazil. We saw so many people get delivered and healed and just come to Christ. It was amazing. Took us a few days to break through all that. And, and uh, I said, remember we were on that trip? And I said, I remember having, we were having a time of prayer. We're praying for one another, and people are being touched by the Lord. And, and I'm laying there sort of under the power of the Lord, just kind of let, resting there. And God had put on my heart about maybe building a new building on this property. And, and I was been praying about how do we go about it? Do we get a building committee? Do we do this? Do we do that? Do we start, you know, do a building campaign and everything? And this is what the Lord did. Everybody say Jesus. <laughs> He's beyond budgets. Some, I like budgets. Budgets are good. So please, families, don't just tear up your family budget or whatever, okay? But sometimes he does things that are just beyond what we understand. And all of a sudden, the Lord begins to speak to me. He goes, I want you to sow seed into India. And he gives me this most bizarre scripture, Zechariah. Was it 812, I believe it was. Or was it 12, maybe Zechariah 12, 8. He said, that it, one of those two verses, it says, the seed shall be prosperous and the ground shall give her increase. Now, in context, it's about the nation of Israel and the seed, the remnant of Israel, okay? But in that moment, the Lord takes that scripture, he breathes on it, and he begins speaking to me about the nation of India. And he says, the seed shall be prosperous and the ground shall give her increase, the remnant of these people shall possess all things. And so all of a sudden, what God began to do, and he began speaking to me about making trips to India, uh, helping over there, all this kind of stuff. We, over the next, like, three years, spent nearly, as a church, raised money, nearly $100,000. We built a community center over there. I did like five major meetings over there. I was participated in three with some other ministers. We raised money. We had hundreds of thousands of people in attendance, outdoor healing, uh, evangelistic meetings. It was crazy the numbers of people we saw come to Christ and heal and all kinds of things like this. And God, meanwhile, he's telling me, sow seed into India and watch the building I'm going to give you. Amen. It was the most bizarre building program that I've ever, I've ever known of. So we get through all of this, we spend all this money. I never do get a building committee, never do try to do any of that kind of stuff or build, because the Lord said, no, 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 watch it. And all of a sudden, over the next, it took about three years, and we go through the financial crisis of 2009, and you're sitting in a miracle building. And I'm, I can tell you story after story, and some of you have heard of them, of how God began to do things beyond just my wildest imagination. There was a lot of work. <laughs> there was some stress at times. But God did it. Everybody say he's amazing, right? You see, Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. We want the, the roadmap laid out right before us. If you do X, then you get Z. If you do X plus Y, then you get Z. We want it all. And believe me, I understand mathematics, okay? We want this and that. But God is not linear all the time. He is very circular in how he operates. What he's after is our hearts. What he's after is surrender. Amen. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what we accomplish. It's about how surrendered we are to him. You see, faith chooses to listen. It obeys what God has spoken. It's easy to hear what God is saying, but believing and obeying God is a different matter. I look back on that 2006 encounter with the Lord, and I wonder, had I not been obedient to do what he asked me to do in India, first of all, I know that there was untold thousands of people that wouldn't have been influenced with the gospel or encountered Jesus, okay? I know that, number one. Number two, I wonder, I wonder would things have happened the way that they did here in the building? Does this make sense, everybody? Sometimes he'll take you on a direction that just doesn't seem to make sense. 
Now, I always caution, especially my young families, listen, know as you know, if you're married, make sure you're, you're, you're you know, getting confirmation, you and your spouse, before you make major changes or whatever, or, or if you're a single person or a single mom or whatever, you know, get others that are trusted and pray. Don't just go get something in prayer and go do it radical without getting confirmation from some others. I shared that first and foremost with my wife and others, and we began to slowly act on it, right? So you, you want to get some input from others, but there are times times even with that, you may not have complete agreements. This makes sense, right? And so I, I'm not sure what Abraham did. Did he tell Sarah, hey, we're going to leave Ere of Chaldees. We're going to go there. We're going to do this. Or did he, he just kind of briefly share the vision? And she's like, okay, I'm on board. Let's go. You know, I, I don't know. We don't really know. His dad already died. I wonder what the other family members said. There's a good chance some of the other family members stayed there in Haran, and they're like, we don't know why you're doing this. It's dangerous. It's a risky faith at times with Jesus. Let's go over to Genesis 13. You doing all right? In Genesis 13, you know, they've kind of been there in Canaan land and went to Egypt for a little bit. And all of a sudden, you know, he's got his nephew Lot there, and there's, they've got too much livestock between the two groups of them. And so Abram tells him, okay, Lot, you go choose whatever land you want. And so Lot goes down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, down towards the plains, and that's a whole other story there. But then in Genesis 13, verse 14, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, so after he lets Lot choose the best land, Humility is a powerful, powerful place to be in the Lord. When we can fully and easily just give others, if they're wanting their rights, God will, God will work it. Does this make sense, everybody? And so, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and, and look from the place where you are. He's got to look. He's got to see. He goes, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Verse 15, for all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. He still has no child, no heir. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, listen to this, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. There are times that you've just got to not only see what God is offering, but walk in the promise. If, if you're going to make a major geographic change or a major change in your life or ministry or whatever, you might want to walk the land first. Get the word from the Lord, but then walk in it a bit. Say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? I, I believe you've been saying this. Okay, I'm here. I, I, Lord, I need confirmation. I need assurance. Lord, is this what you, does this make sense? I would always encourage that before a major, major change in your life. But you've got to put sometimes some feet with your faith. You can't just listen to what he's saying and then not act on it. If you feel like the Lord's saying, hey, get involved in this area of ministry, you can't just sit there and just keep praying about it forever. At some point, you've got to leave your prayer closet and go actually act on it. I hear all the time folks over the years say, oh, gosh, I wish we had more people to disciple. Well, here's the deal. The more that you interact with folks and help them have an encounter with Jesus and find out how amazing he is, you'll have lots of folks to disciple. <laughs> Make sense? Oh, come on, church. It's not just the evangelist. We have this idea of, of big meetings or whatever, and it's the evangelist. That's his job. They've got to you know, bring in the lost. No, no, no. It, God's asked us, each of us, to go make disciples. And how you do that is first being a disciple yourself and letting him just ravish your heart. And then you just simply just begin to just tell others. Because you love Jesus, how amazing he is. And all of a sudden it becomes very attractional. Don't be pushy. Don't be shovey. Right? 
Give people an opportunity and let the Lord begin to work on their heart. But eventually, people will begin to draw around us. Imagine if the church all across America right now began to just be more loving, more kind, and just representing Jesus in a wonderful way. I am guarantee you churches will begin to pack and revival will begin to break out. But pastor, we're waiting for an outpouring of the Spirit. Jesus is waiting for us to get up and go. <laughs> There's a go in the gospel, right? I like what the late Oswald Chambers, a 20th century Christian evangelist, teacher, author, he said this in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. He goes, Faith never knows what is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading it. It loves and knows the one who is need needing it. Knows, knows the one. It's important to really know him. Know him. I like what Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. That English word know comes from the Hebrew word yada. It means to know intimately. We first, the first use of it is when Adam knew Eve. So there's an in, God wants us to know him on an intimate way. I talked last week about the importance of waiting on the Lord. I used uh, Psalm 27, 14. Those that wait on the Lord, right? And so there's something about waiting on the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Renew your strength. And it's twisting yourselves around. There's an intimate place of being in God where that place of intimacy with God becomes so real, so alive, you'll be willing to do whatever he's asked you to do. And all of a sudden, now what seems impossible becomes very probable. I look back at it again, back to that, that moment about the, the sowing seed into India and everything. At the moment, it just seems so big. But what began to just change my perspective on it as I kept coming back to my relationship with the Lord and the history I had with God. I've watched God do this before. I watched him do this when we were missionaries down in Haiti. I've watched God do this when we bought this church property. I've watched, are, are you with me, everybody? I've watched God do this in my family. I've seen God do this in other families. Okay, God. And so all of a sudden, I just began to restore and remind myself of the things that I saw God do. And all of a sudden... It wasn't so big and so impossible. Be still and know that I am God. He is a good father, and he's wanting to draw himself uh, very, very close to him. Abraham discovered God as a father who deeply loves us, and that's my prayer for the 21st century church. We could really come into a place of understanding just how deep that love is that he has for us because God communicates his vision to us through love. It all begins there, this love relationship with Jesus and saying, okay, Lord, what is it that you're after? Lord, what is it? What area of my life do I need to just release so that you can have your way? I want to journey with you and see you unfold this thing um, the way that you said. Remember, he's the author and finisher of our faith. And so if we want more faith, we've got to look to Jesus and be anchored in him. And so this thing of faith that obeys, um, it isn't always easy. If, has God ever asked you to do something that maybe really wasn't easy? You know, there's an old saying, you don't want to come kicking and screaming, right? It, it's much easier just to say yes, but so oftentimes we're resisting, and God loves us, and he will not... <laughs> He will not overpower. You know, even the person that, that, that becomes wayward from the Lord, the Lord will not overpower their free will. He'll work on their heart. That's what we pray. They still have to, we pray it creates a canopy over people for the Spirit of God to begin to move on their heart and to draw them closer to him. Does this make sense? And again, they still have to choose, and they can resist God. They can fight against God and just and say, no, no, no. But as you keep praying, so if you've got family members or friends or coworkers, you, you just keep praying for them. It could take years. Be faithful and pray. But the Spirit of God will bring people into their life and will work on their hearts because they have to choose, right? God's not going to compel them. He's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But we have to pray so that the Spirit of God can move. And so the same thing, the more that we're in touch with him and the more that we are walking like Jesus, the more we affect the world around us and help change that atmosphere, right? And so, you know, 
in a workplace or the, in your family situation, or you know, you and Jesus are an army. You really are. And uh, sometimes we don't feel like it, right? But we are. We're an army. And the more that we realize, no, 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 all of heaven is behind us because you know what? Jesus came, Luke 19, 10, talking about Zacchaeus. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus is all about reaching those that are wayward from him. And so when you know that, you know that he wants to answer the prayer to reach into the heart of the one that's saying no, no, no to Jesus, right? This makes sense, church, right? And so, uh, you know, I just want to encourage you in this, in this time, listen, we can look at the situations around the world and we see the shaking, we see all of this stuff, and it's that, no, 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 we're, we're on the verge. We're on the verge of something that God wants to do on a global scale. And if we just have eyes to see it, look, I, I, I can't affect all the nations, but I can affect those that, that I'm in contact with. Does it make sense, right? And so that's what, uh, that's what he's at. But it's a costly obedience, isn't it? It means that we've got to be willing to take risk. It means waiting upon God, spending time in prayer, then doing actually what he's asked us to do, and then keep doing it even when we're tempted to give up, you know? And so it's not easy to keep going when God said, okay, I want you to do this, and you're stepped out, you're doing it, and opposition, oppression, discouragement. These things are real. Financial hardships, sickness. Uh, one of my pastor friends, he met with another younger pastor and his wife in a private meeting. And the younger pastor, uh, I'd say, I guess he's probably in his mid-40s. And I know him just as an acquaintance. It's one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. He was part of the denomination, I won't mention the denomination, that basically gave him a church property in downtown Philadelphia. They were going to condemn it. He goes, no, no, let me renovate it. Let me try to reach the people in the neighborhoods. There's a lot of Muslims in the area, a lot of unchurched people in the area. And uh, the bishop that was there at the time said, okay. He put thousands of dollars of his own money, raised money, renovated this property, uh, put a garden, a community garden. People were coming and getting food. He's feeding the neighborhood. All of a sudden, people are coming to Christ, and he's making a difference, him and his family. He's got, he's got three teenagers, making a difference. And so year, years of, you know, now several years of ministry, productive ministry, making a difference. I mean, uh, how, many, how many, we have a hard time getting pastors anymore to, to want to pastor churches, especially in inner cities. And so here, he's making a difference. Well, that bishop retires, a new bishop gets in, and all of a sudden there was a particular pastor that wanted to condemn the, the property and convinced the new bishop they needed to go and the property needed to be condemned. And just like overnight, he loses his position, his job. Oh, and he got defrocked from that because he resisted and said, what, why are we doing this? this? He got his ordination taken away, the left foot of fellowship, loses the property, got three teenagers, and oh, by the way, his wife has a problem with her kidney. She's in stage three of kidney failure. I'm, I'm hearing all this on Friday afternoon, and I'm like, everybody say Jesus. And, and this is the first Carolyn's hearing it, and there's not a pastor that I know that hasn't gone through something. I'm like, this is one of the most horrible stories I've ever heard. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He's got three teenagers. And in my heart, you know, in my heart, I was breaking for him and his wife. His wife needs a healing. And I said, what about those teenagers? What's their view of the church now? <sighs> it's a costly obedience there are real spiritual attacks, and we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but there are really powers of darkness that do not want us to succeed in life. And so it's unfair. The enemy does not fight fair. And so, listen, Caroline, I covered your prayers. 
over the years, I, I wish we'd had more of a prayer coverage on some things. I'm just going to be very honest. There have been times I'm like, are we out on an island by ourselves here? By 2030, the Pew Research says that 25% of those of us that are currently pastoring will not be pastoring by 2030, and they said there is no pipeline to replace that 25%. Do we need to move God? Yeah. We also need to support our churches and our pastors. Obedience is costly. He's challenging me right now. It's not just to all of you there's a challenge. What is it that needs to get laid down that Jesus can have preeminence? What is it? What is he after? Abraham, it cost him everything. But it was accounted to him because he believed God as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. You see, to really know God and know you're completely loved and forgiven, that enables me to receive his love, and then I'm able to go through the hardest of times. As I looked at this young pastor, and I wasn't part of that meeting, but I had to meet the other pastor, and we were going out to dinner. I came at the end of the, I didn't know about all the situation. It got shared with me later, and I was just, I, I, I could see it in his eyes. I've seen that look in people's eyes that have been in ministry for a while, and they're just ready to give up, and they're just, they just don't know what, what's next. And the only way that we can keep going, and if some of you, you've, you've heard some of the stories of like Roland and Heidi Baker over there in Mozambique. If you're not familiar with them, they've, folks that have been used powerfully by the Lord to influence Mozambique and Malawi and large part of Africa, but it wasn't always that easy. In fact, when they first had this major encounter with the Holy Spirit 30 years ago in 1994, the, there was a particular church network like a denomination that pro promised them literally a million dollars to, to, to do this children's program over there in Africa and give them the funding they needed, vehicles, all kinds of things. And, uh, but you can't, you can't go to these revival meetings in this one particular church, in this one particular city. You can't do that. If you do that, that's it. We're, you're done. It's funny how the church can be so religious, and yet it's God moving. We fear what we don't understand sometimes. <laughs> so they went. They have this powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. They get prophecies. You're going to see the blind eyes open. You're going to see the deaf ears open. You're going to see the lame walk. You're going to see millions come to Christ. You're going to see all this. And you know what happens? All hell breaks out against them. They lose. The, the government clamps down. They don't get the million dollars. The government clamps down on them. They, they lose the facility they're in. They have to leave. They've got to take all these orphans and march them out and go, go te find temporary place. Uh, cars breaking down, just one attack after another. Eventually, Roland gets cerebral uh, uh, malaria, and they thought he was going to die. I remember that. The good news is he ended up finishing a doctorate. He was in the doctoral program with myself and a bunch of others who finished his doctorate. But there was a two-year period of time the man was comatose. This is a brilliant guy. His parent, he was third-generation missionary, and his uh, 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 family, you know, just just you know, just was amazing history in his family. He had a full-ride scholarship to Caltech. Brilliant mind. Could have been an engineer. Walked away from it to go to a Bible school to serve the Lord. Fly, you know, pilot's license, flies airplanes, and their cerebral was all... This, the attack of the enemy at times, we don't understand it. And, and many of you prayed for him, and he was miraculously healed, but it was a two-year process. Why am I sharing all this? It, to follow the Lord... Heidi said this. She was one of the speakers. Or she said this during the conference, and I've heard her say it before. I've actually, Roland, we, we talked about it in seminary back in 2011, 12, and when we were all in seminary together. And, and uh, he goes, you know, the American church doesn't have a theology for suffering. And I think that's true. 
And I started reflecting these last couple of days on just some of the stuff. And it's like, we, we have an expectation of what revival will look like, what church culture should look like. Um, and Jesus is after something that's so basic, but it's hard for us to get there. And I'll admit, I've not been there at times. And if most of us were honest, we've not been there. We may have seasons where we're surrendered or, or we think we're completely surrendered, but there's maybe still an area in our heart where we're not really surrendered. Abraham, he had to surrender everything. He got up and he went out. He went to a place he couldn't see. He had to surrender everything. And it's costly sometimes what the Lord asks us to do. But we, 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 oftentimes as believers, we have so much, especially in 21st century culture, we, and we get discouraged, and then we start to medicate ourselves, and it's not always drugs or alcohol or food. <laughs> might be TV. Might be recreation. It might be anything other, just to numb ourselves, other than spending time with Jesus. It, it might be anything but to do what he's asked us to do. Mary chose the better part, to sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha was busy and distracted about many things. He was doing good things. She was helping, getting the, the place ready for the Lord. And, and he didn't reprimand her for, for preparing a nice meal for all the, the disciples and everything. No, that was a good, but he goes, Mary chose the better part we got to put this Harvest Fest on next week. I'm thankful for everybody's volunteering and helping. It's not going to happen if we don't work together, right? We all know that. But I sure hope you choose the better part this week and spend time with Jesus. If I was to never see any of you ever again, this is my last time I'd ever talk to you, I would say, Jesus has to be number one in every area of your life. Completely surrendered. Would you come on up, Christina, and play on the keyboard? We want great faith. We want to see great things happen. We want to see our families prosper. We want to, you know, we want all these things. God wants to bless us. Oh, yeah, he, he does. But he's after something first and foremost. He's after a surrendered heart. A heart that is so yielded to him. It's in that secret place that we really know him. It's in that secret place that all fruitfulness flows from. Jesus said, if you remain in me, you'll be a fruitful branch, John 15, and you'll bear much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. He's not asking us to, like, go save a million people. All he's asking us, first and foremost, is to be a lover of Jesus. And then whatever springs out of that, however he would use us to influence others, he'll do the rest. I'm grateful for some of the opportunities I've had to speak to large crowds and places overseas and all that. But the longer I walk with the Lord and the older I get, both my successes, my failures, my mistakes, all of a sudden I realize it really all comes down to how much do I love him and how much am I willing to let him have his way? Am I willing to be like Abraham and sell, tell whoever the lot is in my life? Well, here you choose. It's not mine. I've reached a place with this church. God, it's yours. I mean, it's always been his. Sure, you use Carolyn and I to plant the church in our living room and buy the property and build a building. And sure, there were some others that came alongside and believed with us and joined with us and gave sacrificially and all of that. But in the end of the day, we're just passing through, aren't we? We're pilgrims and strangers on this journey, and he's after something that is way greater. So 
So Holy Spirit, I'm just asking that you would just begin to rest on each of our hearts that the beauty of Jesus, the magnificent glory of Jesus would just be revealed. I just want to ask you a couple questions as I close here. Is there anything God has told you to do that you may be delaying? Abraham heard and he got up and he went. Have you taken a shortcut or two hoping to fulfill his mandate? Could it be that the heavens are closed? That the blessings are withheld because of your partial obedience? Is it possible that some of what you're going through in your life is because there's an area that's not completely surrendered to him? Obedience is better than sacrifice. He's after a surrendered heart. And so, Father, I pray right now, I pray all over the room, and my heart included, Lord, is there any area that's just not been surrendered to you completely? Jesus, you love us. You're not angry at us. You won't compel us to do anything. You invite us in to the inner place of your heart, your very bosom, to know you, to know the God of all creation. To know you is beyond comprehension. And so, Lord, I, I just pray today that we could just surrender afresh. And just right now, all over the room, if you know there's an area in your life you're, you've just, it's just holding you back to say, Lord, I want to release this thing. You may want to make your way out of the front. Just you and God, just say, Lord, I just release it. I give you my heart, all of it, Lord. Use me, Lord, for your purposes. And what I've discovered, we never really quit surrendering. Every day is a choice to surrender. Every day is a choice to say like Jesus said, not my will, Father, but your will be done. And so today, Lord, we just choose your will be done. Your will be done. In Jesus' name. Just minister Holy Spirit. And I want to minister, if there's any here, you just sense the Lord just really on you in a strong way, or there's something he's speaking to your heart, and you're just like, just, I believe God wants to release something right now over you in particular. And so, Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name for your presence to come. Holy Spirit. I hear the Lord say, remain and release. Remain in me and release. Let go of that that would hold you back. There's a new day. Just bless her, brother, Lord. If you're here and it's been going through your heart and mind, I just don't know if I can. I just don't know if I can. I just don't know if I can. God says you can. You've got to take that first step of obedience. That first step of obedience. You can. You can. You can. I encourage you just come. Just come. If you need to go, 
we're dismissed. Keep the live stream going. Just go quietly. Talk out in the foyer. I want to just allow just a time of ministry. Let go and let God. Let him. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but let go and let God. The only way to surrender is to let go of our, our what we're holding on to. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. More. Holy Spirit. Say, I give it to you, God. I give it to you. I've oftentimes, I've had moments where I've prayed, Lord, I've, I've tried my strength. He goes, I know you have. Now let go of it and let me work in my strength. Jesus. 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 Yeah. David, you want to help me? Holy Spirit, just more. I hear the Lord say, it's time. It's time. Let go of it. Let go of it. Jesus, I I just give it all to you. Not my way, but your way. Some of what we have to do to really be obedient is to let go of those areas that we're still holding on to unforgiveness towards others or, or our sense of needing vindication. Say, Lord, I let it go. I, I don't need to, to get even. I don't have to even the score. I don't have to, Lord, I just surrender. I trust you. Holy Spirit more. New day, new day, new day, new day, new day, new day. Family's important to you. The best thing you can do for family is just be that vessel surrendered to Jesus. You have the heart of a shepherd. You have the heart to help others. It starts with just saying, Jesus, take it all, have it all, have it all, have it all, have it all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. 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 Jesus, Holy Spirit. Jesus, Jesus. Just receive his comfort, receive his peace. He's not angry at us. His invitation is always from love. He disciplines. He trains us because he knows what's best. He knows the plans and the purposes he has. And we get angry at God. We get, we want to hold on to our way. We want to hold on to our rights. And God, I want this. I want that. And the way to freedom is to let go. Freedom is found in release and surrender. Jesus. 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 surrender it to you. I surrender him to you, Lord. Just surrender him to you. Just surrender him to you. Just 
surrender him to you. Just leave it in your hands. Oh, God. Just release it. Christine is going to play for a couple more minutes. You're welcome just to sit and kind of rest in his presence. But we're going to kind of officially end the service. I uh, want to encourage everybody, be, just be praying. Draw close to him this week. Draw close to him. Invite a friend. Plan on coming next Sunday. The weather's going to be 20 degrees cooler. It'll be great for that harvest festival. Thank you, Lord.